All right. So much practice and she did practice. Okay, we're live. Good evening. I'm Tony Clark from the Carter Presidential Library. On behalf of our partner, Acapella Books, I want to welcome you to tonight's uh, author program. And I am, in fact, delighted that we've got Clint Hill and Lisa McCubbin Hill back with us for another really wonderful book. I guess I first became acquainted with Lisa's work when I read uh, the Kennedy detail that she wrote with Secret Service agent Gerald Blaine. And at that point, she had already been a TV reporter, an anchor, a freelance journalist in the Middle East. And, and I was just, I was fascinated by the story I, I, about the Secret Service covering uh, Kennedy. Um, and it was while she was working on the, the Kennedy detail that she met Clint Hill, the Secret Service agent who's best remembered for leaping on the back of President Kennedy's limousine as shots were being fired in Dallas. After he retired from the Secret Service, Clint vowed he was never going to write about his experiences. But fortunately for us and for history, Lisa changed his mind. And Together, they have now written four books. Mrs. Kennedy and Me was a number one uh, New York Times bestseller, Five Days in November. And in fact, I remember when they came to the Carter Library to talk about uh, Five Days in uh, November, they said, well, we're working on a new book and it's called uh, Five Presidents, My Extraordinary Journey with Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford. And I said, you've got to come back. And they did. And now their new book is My Travels with Mrs. Kennedy. And in addition, Lisa has written what Publishers Weekly called a meticulously researched and delightful biography of First Lady Betty Ford. Clinton Lisa's longtime writing partnership is, is really now much more than that. They were married last year and we're all pleased with that because they complement each other so. And I'm equally pleased that joining Lisa and Clint tonight is Tom Johnson. Tom, I think everyone knows, is a well-known journalist. He was an aide to President Johnson, publisher of the Dallas Times Herald and the LA Times. He's former president of CNN, longtime member of the uh, LBJ Foundation Board of Trustees and a former member of the Rockefeller Foundation. And most of all, he is a good close friend of Clint and Lisa. So, You'll have a chance to ask questions of Clinton Lisa. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So now welcome to Lisa, Clint, and Tom. And Tom, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Tony. I also should uh, mention that uh, Tony Clark, who is now the Public Affairs Director for the Cardi Library, uh, served with distinction as a bureau chief uh, at the uh, at CNN, uh, among other responsibilities during his career, and uh, there's nobody finer in, in, in our world of journalism than uh, that, that is Tony. Uh, I'll start uh, with a, just a disclosure that uh, I have known Clint since I joined the LBJ White House staff in 1965. It's been a friendship, uh, one that uh, I treasure. Uh, I also have gotten to know Lisa uh, and, the, and the incredible partnership that developed uh, first professionally and now personally, and it's led to a, a very happy marriage. Uh, they're two wonderful people. But I'll kick it off, and I should uh, basically warn uh, viewers uh, that uh, we are attempting to provide uh, photography uh, and and. Uh, especially some terrific still photos as we move through uh, these questions. But we also want to make time for questions from all of you 
out there and, uh, and hope that you enjoy this as much as, uh, as, as I hope you will. Uh, Lisa and uh, Clint, this book, copy of which you're seeing on the screen, uh, is very different from your other books. Uh, it actually begins in 2019 in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, tell us about how you came upon the steamer truck, the deep steamer truck that you describe in the beginning of the book. Well, thank you, Tom, for that nice introduction. Uh, I used to own a home in Alexandria, Virginia. And Lisa and I were back in Virginia, in Northern Virginia in the fall of 2019. And I had decided that it was time to sell that house. I hadn't been there, lived there for years, but I still had things in the house. So I mentioned to Lisa that we should go out there, unlock the house, go in and see what I could uh, do about the stuff that was still there. I'd probably just call 1-800-JUNK. So that's what we did. And I think Lisa can take it somewhat <laughs> more so from there. So yeah, he had pretty much thought he had gotten everything out of it, or he told me he had gotten everything out of the house that was of value to him. And, um, and I had never been to the house. He took me there and um, I saw on the walls in the, in the dining room were these framed pictures um, from the Kennedy administration <laughs> signed by President Jacqueline Kennedy. And when I saw those, I realized, okay, if they're here, there's other stuff here too. So um, I said, you know, maybe we better go through some of this stuff in the house. And we came across this trunk. And as you saw there in the slide, it said Clinton Hill, the White House, Washington, DC. Now, I mean, don't tell me, you don't wanna know what's in that trunk. So I, I asked Clint if we could open it. And I, well, I asked you what was in there, right? Yeah, you asked me what was in there and I explained to you that a few years ago, there had been a flood and that trunk was in that position that it is in, as you see it in the picture. And uh, the water was waist deep. So I'm sure that anything that's in there has been ruined. It's probably filled with bugs and all kinds of stuff. So I think I, he said rats and snakes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that kind of caused her not to want to open it immediately. So we, we uh, went back to our hotel and came back the next day with rubber gloves and garbage bags. And, and then I felt like we were opening up King Tut's tomb, Tom. I really did because I had a feeling there was something in there, something good in there. And uh, so we videotaped it as we opened it up and started pulling out. It was filled to the brim. And amazingly, everything was pretty much intact. You could tell there had been some water damage to some things, but uh, we started pulling things out. And as we did, there were, I would ask Clint about everything we pulled out and he would tell me these stories. And so that's kind of how this, this book begins is we, we start in 2019 and then we go back in time as he tells the stories of all these mementos that he finds that he had forgotten he had. Well, we're going to uh, have re many references to contents of that uh, trunk, uh, but, but many readers also will pick up, I think, some interesting clues as they go through it. At uh, one point you write about uh, Mrs. Kennedy that everything changed after our trip to Paris. On that trip, you write that she, Jackie, showed confidence, deep knowledge of French history, uh, and was very fluent in the French, French language. Uh, you also described her handling of the press. Uh, tell us more about that, Clint. Well, you know, she, as a youngster, she was uh, schooled somewhat in Paris. She lived there for a year, lived with a French family, which helped her with her French language skills. And so when in 61, we she was there with the president as the first lady, she could deal with or talk with de Gaulle directly. She didn't need an interpreter, whereas the president had to deal with a third party. And so no matter who she was talking to in France, it was in their native language. And I got to, to uh, witness personally that she just seemed to gain confidence 
as we went through this trip. It was a very quick trip, about two, two and a half days. But uh, I could just see she grew in confidence from the time that she got there and was talking to all these important people in France, the President de Gaulle, the Minister of Culture, Andre Malraux, and all the others. She just, she had their interest and uh, they seemed to just uh, revel in the fact that they could talk directly with her. Uh, you uh, also described her handling of the press. Uh, we know that sometimes the relationship between the first family and the, uh, the media, uh, not good. T tell, tell us more about that. Well, she had a, an ongoing uh, relationship with the press. I mean, there were members of the press that were her best friends, good friends and good friends of the president. There were other members of the press that she didn't really care for. She had a tough time uh, with some of the female reporters who were covering her. Uh, I guess I better not name names. And, uh, but, uh, what if one of those was Helen Thomas. <laughs> yes, uh, Helen was one. And uh, UPI. And competition, <laughs> and competition over the other network was uh, Randy Lewin. So, and those two were the biggest problem for uh, her because they were very intrusive. They wanted to know everything it was to know from the time that she woke up in the morning until she went to bed at night and then what was going on in bed after she went to bed. I should I mean, emphasize- was very so, intrusive, but- I should emphasize that Helen Thomas of UPI and Fran Lewin of the AP was equally tough with uh, the presidents they covered uh, and I'll mention LBJ as, as one example, but they, they did not uh, go easy, I think, on anybody, but also they were really uh, able to write quite uh, strong pieces as they traveled around the world that often made front pages uh, of it. Uh, and, and, and of course, I love this photo of young Clint standing next to, uh, to, to, to Jackie. Uh, what did the press get wrong about Mrs. Kennedy, Clint, if anything? Well, they one of the things that got wrong was they kept on dealing or almost always just talking about what she was wearing or clothing. They forgot that she was a you know devoted mother, a dedicated a dedicated mother and and wife. She was hands on with the kids. I mean, yes, they had a nanny, but. The nanny only did things as directed by Mrs. Kennedy. And she also instructed our agents how she wanted her children handled. She didn't want them spoiled. She wanted them to grow up like any other child would grow up. I told her many times that, look, those children's last name is Kennedy. They're going to always be known as the son and daughter of a president. And they're going to be treated differently, undoubtedly, throughout their lifetime. She said, but even, even though that was the case, she insisted that when they fall down, you let them get themselves up. When they make a mistake, they have to learn from it. And so we treated them in that manner. And I'd like to add, Tom, one of the, <laughs> the other things I think the press got wrong about her was how really intelligent she was. And like Clint said, they were always writing about her clothes. And um, she went on this historic trip to India and Pakistan, and Clint was, of course, with her. And she was um, she had studied up on, you know, the culture of India and Pakistan and knew the history and was able to talk intelligently with all the heads of state. Um, like he mentioned, she spoke multiple languages and she was really such a great ambassador. And that was one thing the press just really neglected to talk about. And she, you know, she wanted to deal with the, the people at the lower level of society, too, in India and Pakistan. And that, and that was kind of unheard of in, in India, for example, where they had the caste system. But she wanted to she wanted to actually go out shopping. And we had to finally just prevail. And we brought the shopping to her because we knew what would happen if she'd get into a, an area in which there were a lot of shops. It would just be uncontrollable. Because These are pictures of India right this, here, aren't they? This photograph is an example, for example. You see her there in the middle with a hat on. I'm right in front of her and another agent's behind her. There's some other agents surrounding the area, but we were just enveloped by mass crowds.
whenever she was uh, out and about. Before we get too far ahead, we can leave this photo up, but we'll come back to it. Lisa, tell us what it was like to write with Clint. Uh, what was the interview style? Uh, did you ask questions and then type on a computer as he recalled his memories? Uh, what did the process, how did the process work? So, you know, Tom, we've been together now about what, over 12 years that we've known each other and um, spent so much time together that um, we sort of finish each other's sentences. You know, I know how he thinks and how he wants to appear. Um, you know, I know that when he, when he posts things on social media or I help him, he doesn't use exclamation marks. You know, he's just very matter of fact. So I've gotten to know his, his voice. And I guess the way this has always worked with us is he would tell me the stories and so that I got to know the stories almost as well as he did, you know, I can tell you where he was in 19, in July of 1962, you know, things like that. And, um, and then I would sort of put myself um, in his shoes, so to speak, because I, we write in his voice. So I tend to go to my computer and write a chapter and feel kind of take on his personality. I, I kind of um, compare it to an actress or an actor, you know, how they get oh, into the character and I get into his character. Yeah, and I then I show it, him what I've written. And you, you did it magnificently uh, and, and you can continue. This, the slide that we, we have up uh, here is uh, in Pakistan and uh, I'll, I'll switch back to, to maybe Clint. And Clint, uh, one, tell those of us who are interested in automobiles, uh, those, were those Indian autos, or is that those, uh, those Chevys, what, what were they using? Well, they were American cars, but they were belonged to the Indian government, or the right, Pakistani, but, Pakistani government. Uh, President Ayub Khan made sure that we had whatever was necessary. He really bent over backwards to help us during this visit. We were in Pakistan. She was the First, I guess, and I don't know if anybody's been there since the First Lady. We were in uh, Karachi, Lahore, Rawal Pindi, Peshawar, and up at the Khyber Pass. Uh, a pretty complete uh, coverage of the entire country of, India, of Pakistan, a Muslim country. I was there with Eisenhower in 1989. At that time, when there were big crowds like this, and there were humongous crowds for Eisenhower, it was all male. This time in 1962, when Mrs. Kenny was there, women and children, female women and children, were there within the crowds. And it was a surprise to the local government, a surprise to the president, President I have gone. Uh, that hadn't really happened before. And it gave the female populace of Pakistan a chance to say, hey, we could do something too. We don't have to stand back behind our man all the time. That, these cars are not armored cars. No. Uh, they are sort of look like civilian cars uh, that, uh, as you said, were American made, but, but owned by the... Tell us about how in those days, who was in your backup car and how were they armed? And then I see the press car. In this case, the third car is loaded with all the photographers who uh, are clamoring out of that one car. T tell us a little bit about the format of the uh, of the cars, because we'll get to that as it relates to other parts of the trip. Okay, that front car is which car that the protecting, in this case, Mrs. Kennedy's in, and I'm in the car with her. It's being driven by a Pakistani police officer, and in the car with us, in the, in the left or in the, in the rear seat, is President Ayub Khan. Then in the next car is a security car. It's made up mostly just, just one of my people, one of the US agents there, because we didn't have hardly any people. And the rest of them are, in this case, Pakistani. Normally, there would be more than just one of us in that car. But you have to understand that in 1958, when I became an agent, there were only 269 total agents in the entire world. And, uh, and now there are how many? 
oh, it's in the thousands, I would say roughly 5,000 minimum, maybe up to, up to seven. I'm not actually sure <clears throat> any longer exactly how many there are. In the press card, the photographers, tell them about that one. Still the same thing, photographers and the wire services. And uh, on this case, in this particular case, this trip, uh, most media outlets had representatives that traveled to Pakistan, India also, and accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy with uh, the entire trip. It was a big deal. And I should say that often the agents helped us, helped the reporters, helped the photographers, but there were many other occasions when uh, they were rather tough uh, with us to keep us sort of a, at a distance for a number of security reasons, but also uh, it depended a lot on what kind of relationships at times we developed uh, with Clint and, and the agent, just, uh, how well we were treated. Let's move on then to the photos uh, going, 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 going forward. That's this is down in Karachi. That's a story in itself. That gentleman with the uh, uh, black coat and the white hat is a um, camel driver. He is a camel driver and very familiar to the people in the Johnson administration because a year before Mrs. Kenny was in Pakistan, president, vice president, then vice president, Johnson went to Pakistan. And he saw this guy driving a camel down the street, stopped the car to talk to this guy. He invited him to come to the United States. He never thought that that was going to happen, of course. Well, the guy took him up on it, and the Pakistani government sent him to the United States, and the United States accepted him as a tourist. And so uh, when Mrs. Kenny went to Pakistan, it was almost mandatory that she at some point had to cross paths with this guy and say hello for the vice president. <laughs> In fact, she had a letter, I think it was, from a vice president Johnson for him. And he owned this camel. So we had arranged to meet him in a place in Karachi. And he brought his camel, brought his wife, who was a little teeny thing, and his uh, child. And uh, nobody thought that Mrs. Kennedy and her sister, who was up there with her sitting, would want to get on the camel. They weren't dressed that way. They just had dresses on. But sure enough, as soon as they got there, that was one of the first things they wanted to do was get on the camel. Then they wanted him to have the camel rise. <laughs> then they wanted to take hold of the reins. Then she wanted to run him herself. And he was hanging on for dear life because he knew that if anything went wrong, he was really going to pay an enormous price. Oh. And so he was being, he was really scared. And he finally got really, he, they had control of the camel all the way, but it was a little bit touchy once in a while and got the camel stopped and they were laughing. Mrs. Kenny and her sister, Lee, were having a wonderful time and uh, got the camel to get back down in their correct position. And then they got off. And you can see that it's not the appropriate type of clothing to be wearing riding a camel. <laughs> Especially with all the press photographers around. Everybody else was having a wonderful time getting pictures of that. <laughs> All right, as we move to the next one, uh, what did Mrs. Kennedy love to do when she was not in public, Clint? This is what she loved to do. This is out in Middleburg, Virginia. She's on top of a horse named Paint. She, the horse was owned by Another some friends. Another horse named Rufus. Oh, that's right. That's right. That, that this horse is named Rufus. Really? And yeah, he's a, a, a what I call a Pinto. And he was owned by a friend of Mrs. Kennedy's. Uh, Mr. Fout, and you see him up there with one of her children, and that's what she liked to do. She liked to have the children uh, have the opportunity to know what it was like to be around a horse. Here you, you see her running with Caroline on top of her uh, pony macaroni, uh, leading him through what was uh, called the lead line class and the pony club out there in Middleburg. And she loved this. She, Caroline, and a number of other little girls and boys were parts of the pony club. And they rode horses like this with their mothers 
with immediate attention at all times. Had a wonderful time. And this one? That's taken over in, in, uh, in Italy. But she loved to water ski, oh, right? She, Wherever and, she was. And she's very good at it. She got in trouble here, not in this particular picture, but in one of these pictures you'll see she has, I don't think this is the right picture. Yeah, that is. It is? Yeah. Okay, she's got Caroline on the skis in front of her. And if you notice, there is no safety gear whatsoever. And oh. when this photo was published specifically in the UK, the people in, in the UK really got upset that she had allowed her daughter to go out there on the skis like this without safety equipment. They admonished her severely for her lack of safety. How far away like? were you, Clint? And were you on the a, a boat that's shown in the background? Generally speaking, no, I'd be on the boat that was pulling her so we can get to her real quick. And what were her swimming skills? What were her swimming skills the event she did fall? She was an excellent swimmer, and so was Caroline. Really? Caroline learned to swim when she was just, a, just above the infancy. And her father would, they'd go out in the ocean. Uh, on something like the honey pits, the a yacht, and he'd be, he'd dive off and swim out around the boat, and Caroline would just jump right off the boat and jump into his arms into the water. She had no fear of the water whatsoever. Oh, now and Lisa, she, you actually discovered something in the <clears throat> trunk that we mentioned earlier uh, that to me is rather fascinating. You found something that you thought was a pocket knife, but it wasn't. What yeah. was it? Here, the, here it is. I actually have it. It what? Well, I asked Clint. I said, "What is this?" Sure, there she is. And there's it. Mrs. Kennedy using something. Her, she had one like it. What was it? It's a Minox camera, generally used by people in the intelligence industry to copy photographs surreptitiously, called a spy camera. And, yeah, it takes very good pictures. And who, who is she shooting? That's the U.S. Ambassador to India, John Kenneth Galbraith. But she's shooting the press. <laughs> so I think she's shooting out at the press. That's yes, right. that's correct. And these are some of the photos that Clint, that we found in the trunk with this spy camera. There was in this little box, and there was a whole packet of little square photographs. And these are the photos that he took with the spy camera. This is um, in Ravello, Italy, on the yacht with um, Gianni Agnelli's yacht and you're on the stern of the boat. And uh, this is another one that you took. And Mrs. Kennedy's there on that. Is that the Riva that That's you That's a Riva, yes. So I thought this was just amazing. These are photos that have never been seen before, never been published. And along with so many of the photos in the book, Tom, they're just pictures that, uh, thank God he didn't call 1-800-GOT-JUNK. That was my intention. I so hope, and again, <laughs> this is my copy, uh, but, but I so hope that everybody thinks of not only the text, but the photos in here are just spectacular. And, and as you said, many of those who buy this book We'll be seeing these photos for the first time. Now, Clint, this boat seems to be overloaded by U.S. standards. Uh, uh, how did you deal with something that uh, appeared to be a violation of, uh, of, 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 of the boating rules? Of the boating rules? Yes. The, the, the same rules that say that we must have life vests for each person aboard, that each boat about this size can take normally up to about eight passengers. <laughs> Well, this was back in 1962, so I'm not sure there were any regulations at all at that time. But even, <laughs> even if there were, usually people who saw who it was, it was Mrs. Kennedy, they just turn away, They'd go ahead and have fun. That was their attitude. Now, uh, everybody really that, wanted her to find satisfaction. That cover photo uh, is, is also inside the book, uh, has a story attached to it from your trip, or this trip. Uh, in the summer of 62. You write, and I quote, there's no denying the intimacy that developed between Mrs. Kennedy and me on the trip to, is it Ravello? 
Yes, Ravello. Ravello. Uh, it wasn't romantic, but it was beyond friendship. Okay, Clint, time to tell it. Uh, <laughs> how was it? Well, we did, we had a very, very strong bond, she and I. And it really developed over this period of time from I began working with her just shortly after the election in 1960, before they were even inaugurated. I was assigned, had to go out and meet her on the Friday after the election. And uh, that's when I, we started. She didn't want me there. I didn't want to be there. But gradually, we started to get along. And we grew in knowing, knowing that we could trust each other. I trusted her. She trusted me. And I respected her. And she began to respect me. And so that's what made it work. And we had a very deep bond because we experienced a lot of things together. Uh, things that weren't always pleasant, like the death of her son uh, who died in, in 2000, uh, what, uh, 1963, in August of 1963. Uh, he was born under an emergency at uh, Otis Air Force Base in Massachusetts. We were up there for the summer. And when he, when he was delivered, it was determined that he had a lung disease, with lung problems. Uh, they needed to get him to a better facility because it was a lung problem. They couldn't fly him. They had to go by motor, so they took an ambulance. I had an agent go with him going to Boston. The president flew up from Washington to be with him. Mrs. Kennedy couldn't leave the hospital in, in Elvis Air Force Base, uh, but he only lived until the next day. And so it was a tragedy. They had been so looking forward to this birth because she's had a she had a hard time of carrying children to term. And uh, so this one was slightly premature, but not much. But he just, poor little guy, as long as we couldn't handle it. Tell us about this rowboat, and everybody seems to be about ready to sink. Well, we we were using a, a big yacht owned by Johnny and Yelly, owner of the Fiat Corporation. And we went from the yacht in a rowboat out to a place called Pestum in Italy, that, where there are <clears throat> all kinds of uh, famous things to look at and see. The press finally caught up with us. Then when it was time to leave, we got in our little rowboat, took back to the yacht. And <clears throat> the condition of the sea had changed. And as you see, uh, I have my mouth wide open because I'm screaming at the press. You see them standing here with their cameras. And I'm yelling, please push us, help us. Don't let us sink. <laughs> She's laughing because she thinks it's rather funny. She had a weird sense of humor sometimes. And uh, they finally, one of the guys did give us a push. And we did manage to get out and get out, manage to get back on the yacht. But uh, Oh, those press people. Yeah, one of the guys <laughs> took a picture. And sure enough, had it printed. And there I am, screaming my lungs out at the press, trying to get him to help us. Uh, you should know, incidentally, I, I, so, something to repeat. But there probably were days when we in the press, White House press corps, uh, and even in the White House press office, would not have been that unhappy if an agent sank. It oh, was well, really on the day. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure you could get a bet on that, that they'd be about 99.9.9% happy if they'd have seen me down completely covered with water. Okay, Clint, you say in the book that. Uh, I mean, there were very rarely any big, 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 big issues. Now, this wait a minute, before we jump to that, this is this is Caroline and and Jackie. And where where is this? It's in Ravello. Also, oh. I had to make a deal with the press. They were being so intrusive. I finally convinced her to pose uh, for the press in a bathing suit with her daughter. And with that, they the press agreed to back off and give her some privacy, and they did. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, that uh, uh, Mrs. Kennedy spoke very softly, and I know from having to talk with people who do speak very softly 
including Eleanor Krista, that that could be a problem uh, at, at time. Uh, but but uh, what what were some of the issues such as this one that troubled you? I mean, what were some of the big problems such as this one? Yeah, that, that this is a typical of what happened. Uh, when she, we in the Secret Service realized that her love was for horseback riding and riding in these hunt groups out in Virginia, cross country, it was the question was raised, well, what are we going to do? We have to buy horses, we have to maintain them, we have to have a stable, we have to have a groom, we have to do this, do that. The agents aren't familiar with riding horses, they're going to have to be trained. So the decision was made at a level higher up in the mine that uh, the agents wouldn't accompany her by horseback. They would surveil her by vehicle and be as close as possible. Well, sometimes you couldn't. You Sometimes you, she'd be out of sight. In this case, she was with a group of, uh, of people that she knew and rode, rode with. They were hunting a fox. They're going cross country and they approach this fence and one of the photographers had gotten wind of where they were going approximately had secreted himself near this fence and he wanted to get a picture of her jumping over this fence. Well, when he exposed himself by raising, standing up or doing whatever he did and put his camera up, the horse just stopped. Mrs. Kennedy didn't. She went right over the horse's head. She went over the fence. You see her hands are out extended. Fortunately, she just caught her hands on the, on the ground, did a somersault, came up standing up, got back on the horse and rode off. Wasn't hurt in any way. But I, I was bad. That, I hope that the viewers will once again notice Clint has basically blamed this on the press. Uh, well, <laughs> this was the photographer's fault. It was the photographer's fault. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, that, that fall could have really hurt her bad. It could have, she could have broke her. She could have broke her neck. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but she was such a good athlete too. She was wasn't a great. She? she was a wonderful athlete. She loved to ride horses, and she rode as often as she could. She could swim like a fish. She played golf. She played tennis. She water skied, as you've seen. So, I mean, she was a good athlete all the way around. Uh, Clint, you mentioned about Jackie's faith uh, being very strong and said, I know in one part that the Pope spent more than a half hour with us. Can you tell us more about her religious views? Well, she was very, very uh, devoted as a Christian. She was a Catholic. Uh, she had always had a good relationship with the priests in the parishes that they worshipped in, whether it's Washington or, or anyplace else. <clears throat> and uh, I think she also tried to raise John and Caroline in, in such a manner that they too would uh, develop that same strong faith. Uh, the president's mother, Rose Kennedy, uh, she went to mass every single morning seven days a week really uh i mean she was so devote and i think uh she saw that and witnessed it and appreciated it uh and this is in uh ravello you're behind her there yes, she went is, to mass even when she traveled yeah we right? were we were in yes we were in ravello italy and we went to mass and i'm just immediately behind her there uh but uh when Sunday came around, that's where you went. You may do other things, but you went to Mass, too. But turning to another area, you write in your book how disappointed you were in 1960 when you were not assigned to the presidential detail of JFK, particularly since you had been on the Eisenhower presidential detail. Did it take you long to realize what a once-in-a-lifetime experience that you would have, and as you have shown us, as we are moving through these photos, but a once in a lifetime experience you would have on the Jackie Kennedy detail and how much more exciting it would have been, I think, than even the Ike detail. And it was more exciting. I mean, it took about uh, maybe seven or eight months because 
once I did the advance in Paris, then I had to do an advance in Athens for her. Here. And and that's this this uh, photograph is is from that trip in Athens. She's with the Prime Minister and uh, Prime Minister Karaman Lee and his wife in Athens. And I think you go carefully, you'll see Franny Lou in there on the left. <laughs> yes, they never let us out of their sight if they could avoid it. Um, good reporters. <laughs> they were they, they were doing their job. That's the whole thing. They really did do their job. But uh, sometimes their job conflicted with mine. And uh, here we are again, back in, in, in Greece. And uh, she just, she really loved this area and the climate and people. But you realized just that you got to travel all over the world. Oh, that was right? fantastic. And you weren't expecting that. Here we are in Morocco. There she is, we were at a, we flew to Morocco from, being aboard the Christina, a yacht in the uh, Mediterranean, owned by owned by Aristotle Onassis. This was in 1963, October, and uh, we were getting off just before we left the Christina. Word came down that the uh, King of Morocco wanted she he wanted her to come to Morocco to Marrakesh to help he and his family celebrate the 40th day of life of their new child, a little boy. And uh, so he sent a plane for us, picked us up in Athens, flew to Marrakesh, gonna have a big party that night, but uh, some hostility broke out at the border between Algeria and Morocco and he had to take care of that. So he had the party taken over by his uh, brother, Crown Prince, and so we were there at this party and we had one of the things that happened at the party was uh, they passed around, they had food and then they had things after dinner. They passed around on trays. And I noticed she was taking one of these little brownie, round brownie things. She consumed it and I thought, I better taste this and see what this is. So the guy would bring it around. I asked him, I said, what are these? And she said, oh, this is a Mor Moroccan delicacy, make you very happy. <laughs> so I thought, well, I better see what this is. So I took a, I took a bite and I discovered that uh, majun. majun is what they were called and they're made out of hot sheets. Oh. It's their, their version of uh, the marijuana brownie. Wow. Uh, how was it, Cliff? Well, I only had the one bite, so it didn't affect me much. But uh, it, it, it was—I could tell it was going to do its job. Sure. Clint, tell us now. We know who Jackie is here in this photo. Who are the other two women? Uh, that's her sister Lee, and the, on the right, that's the Crown Prince, the brother of the king. All right. Tell us and a that, little bit more about Lee and our relationship between the two of them. <clears throat> she and Lee were very close as sisters. Whenever there was a problem, Lee. And Jackie or Mrs. Kennedy would get together. Uh, Lee was married to Prince Stanislaus Radziwill, and they lived in London. And so London was kind of like a stopping off place. She'd stay with them at their residence not too far from Buckingham Palace. In fact, it's on Buckingham Street or Buckingham Place or something. And uh, for example, when uh, the young boy died two days after birth. Lee left and came, flew to the United States to be with Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, when and there is a description on this photo that our viewers may not be able to read, but I have just learned to read it. Uh, it says, Mr. Hill, are you happy in your work? James are you happy fun in your work? Uh, Tell me well, about I had, a big, I had a big smile on my face if you look closely at the photograph. Yeah. And this was that uh, night at the party. That night at the party. <laughs> and I think she assumed I had eaten more than just a bite of that majun. <laughs> now, I noticed though that she calls you Mr. Hill, and you have already been with her. 
quite a bit. Uh, when when did it become Clet? Never did. It we never were all, did. I was always Mr. Hill, and she was always Mrs. Kennedy. Even to this day, uh, I I never refer to as Mrs. Onassis. I only refer to her as Mrs. Kennedy. And I noticed that she signs it J B K. Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. Yes. Bouvier being her maiden name. Black uh, and, 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 and again, Clint, how many agents on, like the, on that trip uh, were you able to have with you? Uh, well, generally, there were only two of us assigned to Mrs. Kennedy. And I wasn't to me, I was the number one, I was the number two guy to start with. Yeah. And he uh, finally uh, was called back to the United States when we were on a trip. Uh, for some reason, I never did actually find out why, and I was put in charge and remained in charge from that point on. Um, well, according to my sources, uh, Mrs. Kennedy found that agent, Jim Jeffries, more rigid, more rigid, uh, especially on a trip to London. Uh, what were the qualities that Mrs. Kennedy liked about you so much that you would be promoted to her lead agent? Uh, why, did, why did she like you so much? Well, she loved to do things just for the moment. And I could adapt and adjust. I, I wasn't, you know, he would always say, no, you can't do that. And she didn't like to hear that word, no, you can't do that. Um, and I, I don't think I ever, I never did actually say it. I'm like, no, you can't do that. Uh, I could find a way to do something. Uh, for example, sometimes she'd want to go shopping somewhere, and I'd convince her it would be a better idea if somebody else did the shopping for her. And then usually in that situation, she would say, well, then if I'm, if I mean she's not going shopping, I better go shopping for her which I did occasionally. I went to shopping with her for her in Italy. She wanted to go to Capri and go shopping. And I knew that was gonna be a desolate disaster. So I convinced her otherwise that she had me go. I met a friend of hers, the Countess met- uh, Irina Galatzin. And she did the shopping. I just did the paying and whatever was necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, and by by paying, I mean everything was charged to the Kennedy <coughs> office in New York. The American taxpayer didn't pay for anything. President Kennedy didn't even let her or want her to, <coughs> to fly anything but commercial air, which we did. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, sorry about that. And we flew <laughs> Pan Am or Trans World internationally. In the United States, or up and down the East Coast, we would travel on the private plane owned by the Kennedy family. Uh, so the only time she ever flew military air uh, was with the president when he was traveling and she was with him. Or there were a couple of times uh, we had to do something, and the only way we could do it was military air. I remember coming back from the Cape once, and we had to travel military air, air. So it was few and far between that we were on an aircraft, which cost the taxpayers any money. I think I should remind the viewers that today, uh, not only do ca cabinet officers uh, have uh, government jets available to them, but White House staffers uh, uh, have both uh, cars and access to uh, government aircraft. Uh, it's 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 a different world, and even have Secret Service protection uh, uh, today. Uh, Clint, did Jackie ever get mad at you, and if so, about what? Really mad at me? Really mad? No, I don't believe really mad at me. The turtle. Well, disappointed, perhaps. I, a few things happened. Uh, 
Uh, I was trying to explain to her what we were going to do during the Cuban Missile Crisis. That well, I was telling her that in the event we had word that the missiles were had been on their way, I'd be taking she and the children to the nearest shelter if we were at the White House or if we were out in the Middleburg, we'd be going to a relocation site. Uh, and she just kind of rebuffed me and said, look, this is what I'm going to do. And told me that she was going to just take the two children, walk out on the South grounds and stand there like all the rest of Americans have to do if, if there was going to be a missile attack. And uh, so be it. Uh, she was not about to get, have us give her preferred treatment. Um, you also write, I learned to read her. It's read like, her, sure. Yeah, I, I could read her in a crowd when she was fed up with things and she wanted to move or get out of there. I could, she, all she had to do was look at me in a certain way and off we'd go. I'd just get her out of there. We, we understood each other well enough so that I could understand what she wanted. She didn't have to verbally tell me. And I, she understood what I was doing and uh, never complained about it. The only time she ever complained was we were out in Middleburg we were looking, going to a new, she would bought a new piece of property for them to build a home on. I was taking her there. It was right through a wooded area and it was a little lane and driving her in the station wagon. I was driving, she was in the right front seat and a turtle crossed the road and I couldn't stop. And all you could hear was crunch, crunch. Oh. Drove over the turtle and squashed it with both the front and the back wheel. And it was, oh, Mr. Hill, what have you done? <laughs> and uh, so that was the one time she really did uh, admonish me for doing something that I really didn't want to do, didn't have planned on. I, I want to ask this one and then let's see if we could turn. To, uh, I don't know, uh, Tony, whether we might be able to bring in some questions from, a, I don't know quite how it's going to work technologically, but. Um, think about, uh, again, Clint, you write that Mrs. Kent's Kennedy very successfully used her feminine wiles, that's W-I-L-E-S for those, uh, very, used her feminine wiles occasionally on diplomats and on world leaders. Uh, Clint, did she use her feminine wiles on Clint Hill? Oh, sure. <coughs> <coughs> I should tell everybody, Clint has been battling a cough. Uh, he's, I've been trying to make sure he's got the best medical care that's available anywhere in the nation as a part of our friendship. Uh, and, 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 and Lisa's been looking after him with every imaginable potion that, that can, 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 can keep him. Uh, he, he may or may not disclose to you that, uh, that, uh, that he, he might not have done tonight, but he felt like he really wanted to do tonight. For all of you who are who are viewing this, and I'm so glad he, he he did. Yeah, I'm doing okay. I have COPD, Tom. For anybody out there, see, chronic ob obstructive pulmonary disease, because I was stupid enough to smoke between the ages of 19 and 50. That's 40 years ago. I quit smoking, but I'm still suffering the consequences of my actions at that time. So. Um, what was your question? <laughs> well, Tony, I, I was I asked, uh, uh, you, and you answered it. Did she use her feminine wiles on oh, you okay. to persuade you to do what yeah, the right she, thing? If she did, and she used them like a in her talking with De Gaulle in French, uh, they became very very good friends. Then her dealing with uh, the Minister of Culture from, from France. Andre Malraux, both in France. And then he and his wife came to the United States and toured the galleries. And she was after him there to talk about how much it would mean to the American people to have the Mona Lisa brought from France to the United States. And would she, he please go back and talk to De Gaulle again about that possibility? And sure enough, she had her way. They, allowed the Mona Lisa to come to the United States. Now, insofar as my own self, sure. I mean, 
I'm off one after one evening. I'm home back in the Moe Hotel, just about to go to bed. My shorts and t-shirts sitting on the bed, and the phone rings. And it's Mrs. Kennedy. She says, Oh, Mr. Hill, the president and I would like to have you do something for us. Now you notice she said, the president and I would like to have you do something for us. Yeah. It wasn't just she, the president and I. <laughs> And so I said, okay, Mrs. Kennedy, what's that? And she said, my brother-in-law, Prince Ratzio, and the president's really good friend, Charlie Spaulding, are down here, and they're going to go on a little hike. And the president and I are going to go out and see them occasionally. And we know the Secret Service is going to have to go out there when we go out there. And in order not to attract attention of the press and things, we think somebody, the Secret Service, should be there with them all the time so you don't have to send agents back and forth and attract the crowd. I said, all right, well, what do you want me to do? And she said, we'd like to have you accompany them. I said, okay, what time, when are they leaving? She said, oh, about midnight. I said, okay, I'll be there. And so I thought, what the heck, you know, what I got myself into now. So I got dressed, went and picked them up and took them out to a brand new highway that had just been completed. We hadn't been open to the general public yet. And we started walking from the uh, exit to Palm Beach toward Fort Lauderdale. And they told us that there was a 50 mile range. That's how far it was. And I thought, man, these shoes I've got. I didn't have hiking shoes. I had floor shine dress shoes. Oh. That's the only thing I had to wear. And they worked, but I did manage to get pretty good blisters. Um, but anyway, I made it 50 miles. They made it 50 miles. Uh, that was just one of the things she got you to do. Yeah, right? that's just one. <laughs> I'm going to read a couple passages that really hit me hard in this uh, in this book, um, and I'll just maybe do do one. Now, following the assassination, you advised Mrs. Kennedy, that the Secret Service Director, I believe that was Jim Rowley, uh, assigned you to return to the White House. You write that Mrs. Kennedy said to you, and I quote: "I know that I'm being selfish when I say this, Clint." Mr. Hill, but it's hard to imagine what it will be like to not have you around. She wrote a handwritten letter to the Secretary of the Treasury, which oversees the Secret Service, and about you she wrote these exact quotes. He, Mr. Hill, is the only person who has known us for four years, whose judgment I trust and who I think is competent enough to set up the kind of Secret Service detail I would like to have in the future. She wrote that it, quote, would be an enormous relief if you could come back, Mr. Hill, from time to time, perhaps to accompany me on a foreign trip. That letter was her way of letting you know that she was not quite ready. To let you go. Yeah, it was very kind of her to write the letter and make all the statements that she made to then Secretary Dillon, Secretary of the Treasury. We were part of the Treasury Department at that time. And uh, you also write about a very ultra sensitive matter. It is the first time, and I've known you, as I said, since 1965, it's the first time I've ever known you to go public with it. Um, and yet I want it to, tonight to be a focus on the happier times, and I think it has been. Uh, you will be remembered in the history books as a result of that photograph of you climbing on the back of the presidential limo within seconds of the time that Lee Harvey Oswald shot JFK. And I just want to make this comment as a former editor and a former publisher and a current friend. All of us, including journalists, historians, White House staff members, 
even the Warren Commission investigators concluded that you did your absolute best, Plant Hill, and yet you somehow thought that had you been faster or even had you been positioned on the rear running board of the presidential limo where the staff had taken you off, that you could have taken the bullet, somehow saved the president. I hope that you will never, ever, ever question that again. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Tony? Tony? Yep, just a second. I'm trying to turn my camera on. Um, for some reason, my camera doesn't want to go on, but you can You're hear on. me. You're on. Let me see you. There I am. There so we've got it. We have a couple of questions uh, for for Clint, and they're they're kind of the same. After you left the Secret Service, did you ever? stay in contact with um, the Kennedys, uh, Caroline John John, Mrs. Kennedy? Mrs. Kennedy called me a few times after I had gone. I was back at the detail. Uh, generally speaking, it was to complain about some way, some manner in which the agents in New York were, were handling the children. And I managed to be able to uh, call and talk to somebody on the detail and get it changed. And uh, she was very satisfied. Uh, she, just a couple, three times. And then I talked to her for the final time. Later, the time I ever talked to her was on uh, in 1968 when Bobby Kennedy's casket was brought to Washington, D.C. to Union Station. I went there. I was at that time the agent in charge of presidential protection for President Johnson. I went there with President Johnson, and I briefly had a chance to say something to Mrs. Kennedy, and she to me, and it was strictly, uh, uh, nice to see you, Mrs. Kennedy, I'm sorry for what has happened, and she just thanked me, and we all went our way, and I really had not, no more contact with her from that point on. What, did, what about, say, Caroline Kennedy? Uh, I've not, I didn't have any, I've never had any contact with her, except through third parties, so an agent who was uh, working with the uh, Carolines and John, uh, Jack Walsh, who, who uh, up in Boston. And we saw her in uh, 20, around 2011, when she was uh, uh, releasing her mother's tapes. The, the audio tapes, and uh, we went to the JFK library. We were invited to the JFK library. And we saw Caroline. And we saw Caroline had dinner that night. She had a private dinner for a number of people, and we were included. One, one of our viewers was asking about her musical taste. I think we all know that President Kennedy liked to listen to Camelot, but uh, did she listen to uh, the music, the popular music at that time of the time? They had, uh, you know, vinyl. Uh, what was seventy eights? I guess they were forty five. No, no, they're big, big seventy oh. eights. And I, uh, at one point, she gave me a stack, uh, and I stupidly, eventually destroyed them. And the and the uh, containers they were in, which had some stuff written them on them, I imagine that would have been worth something today. <laughs> Uh, but I destroyed the stuff. Anyway, she all kinds of music. Well, well, not not jazz so much. I I'm, I personally I like jazz, but they uh, they liked uh, music from all genres. Um, I don't know what else to tell you because uh, I was going to say during that time period, it's kind of the it's pre Beatles. It's um, more um, uh, Elvis Presley and that sort of thing in terms of yeah. popular music. But it, like was Andy Williams popular at that time? I think yeah. was Frank, but Frank Sinatra, you know, he Frank was uh, someone who uh, participated in in a lot of activities, like for the gala prior to the inauguration. He set that all up, and he was. Uh, a Kennedy kind of a fan, and he would uh, oftentimes call Mrs. Kennedy, telephone her, 
and she didn't really want to talk to him. And so she had left word with the operators and with me that when he calls to put him through to me. And so I had ended up talking to Frank Sinatra all the time. And uh, he, his interest was really in how the Kennedy family was getting along because this was after old Joe had had his stroke and uh, he was just showing an interest in the, in the family in itself. But, a nice enough thing, but she, she didn't want to be bothered. Mm -hmm. An another viewer was asking whether you attended uh, her funeral or uh, John John's. John's, no, I did not. But yes, Mrs. Kennedy, I was in attendance at her burial at uh, Arlington Nemes National Cemetery. I was call given a call, call by this agent, Jack Walsh, who called me to say that the Caroline and John had asked him to call me and let me know that she was, she had died, that she was going to be buried at Arlington, and they invited me to attend, which I did. And that story actually is in the book, in my travels with Mrs. Kennedy. And, and one last question from a, a viewer, really, is to Lisa, because you wrote about uh, Betty Ford. You have a perspective of, of First Ladies. What is it that made Betty Ford unique? Then the viewer was saying, you know, it seems like every first lady is unique. Um, there's something about Betty Ford, and there's certainly something we remember a lot that we remember about Jackie Kennedy. Well, I think the interesting thing about the first ladies is, you know, they they really didn't choose this position. They were thrust into the limelight. It was their husbands who were the politicians. And they happened to have married a politician. Now, maybe when they married them, they knew at the time that this was going to happen, but most likely not. And um, there's no um, there's no guidebook or official way for a first lady to to behave or her official position. It's you know there's just all these things expected of them, and um, they they each take on their own roles and I think it's a really difficult job actually um, and especially for for Jackie Kennedy she didn't want to be in the limelight she she really just wanted to be a mother raising her children um, Betty Ford she didn't want to be there when she was there um, she was ready she thought her husband was going to retire but then you know she embraced it and um, the first ladies that I have studied and researched seems like you know they really come into their own and they make the best of it. Yeah. You know, and Mrs. Kenny and other first ladies, they leave their mark when they're gone. Uh, for example, Lady Bird Johnson, she's known for the flowers, especially spring flowers down in Texas, for getting away rid of uh, road signs, big billboard signs at one time. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy is known for refurbishing the White House with American antiquities and historical pieces that were actually uh, made or in the United States and for saving the area around Lafayette Park from being uh, just a bunch of high rise buildings. She managed to make sure that they maintained the type of structures that are there now that were there then in 1961 when they took office because the, the idea was to tear down that low two level structure, build a high rise. They, she interceded and she has recently been uh, praised for it with a plaque there in Lafayette Park. Um, there's, that reminds me of one other thing, Clint. Um, uh, one of the things that it's an image of the Kennedy administration that I think a lot of us have is in the Oval Office um, and John John sticking his head out of the Resolute desk. And you were instrumental in getting the Resolute desk had never been used in the, the Oval Office uh, before, but you were there when it was decided to to put it there. Can you tell that story? It. Yeah, she found that drug. She, were, she was on a, 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 she traveled to every place that the GSA had stored furniture. 
to find these, whatever she thought was necessary. She found this big, beautiful desk. I think it, was, it had been covered with a tarp or something and had paint buckets on top of it or whatever. And she recognized it for what it is. And it's been there ever since. Uh, all the presidents enjoy it. They love that. It's a beautiful desk. And you know what, Tony, you've said a couple of times now, you've called him John John. Clint recently uh, told me something that I didn't know before. Yeah. That's not what the president called him. You know how that became? The, the press decided he must be John John because they heard the president say to him, hey, John, John, <laughs> you know, like he said his name twice, but it wasn't John John. It was, hey, John. Like he didn't and hear he didn't him. He didn't hear him the first time, so he called it John again. And when the press heard that, they thought he called him John John, and that on it stuck. But the uh, Jackie <laughs> and the president never called him John John. He was just John, one John. Yeah. Oh, Tom, any last questions? Well, I guess I uh, would like this on behalf of all of us who have known and do know, who have followed uh, and continue to follow and Clint, and what an extraordinary, uh, I, I, Clint has never considered himself a hero. I mean, at no time. In fact, I've heard him almost reject uh, that description of a hero, but he is a hero. A hero, not just for the images that you saw today, uh, or the or what you will read about him in, in in this book, but the way in which he has handled his role as a person, not as an agent, uh, not as um, you know the guy who hoped that he could find a way to run faster and leap onto that car and save a president and whatever. But, but, but as a guy who has been a friend to so many of us over the years and continues to be, I am particularly, I really mean this, I'm grateful that he discovered Lisa um, and, and, and that he, and the two, two of them have, I mean, just the idea of being able to turn out the books. I mean, it's rather extraordinary. Um, so, so I really just want to be in my part of this by a, a, a huge thank you to uh, Clint and Lisa for what they have done and what they continue to do. And I hope that you know from really from the bottom of my heart how much we appreciate and, and care about both of you and uh, look forward to the next one. <laughs> I was going to say, I wonder if there's another trunk in that house that uh, <laughs> needs to be uh, needs to be examined. Oh, but I, no. Thank God there's not. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we do, as Tom says, I, as I said at the start, we owe Lisa a, a great amount of credit for getting Clint to tell these stories uh, for us and, and for history. And I think everybody's gonna to wanna to pick up a copy of uh, my travels with Mrs. Kennedy. It is the, the photographs, the text, it's just a fascinating uh, look back. So Clint Hill, Lisa Hill, Tom Johnson, thank you all very much. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.